Samsung is one of the largest electronics companies in the world. Yeah. Last year it, it, it sold more than 45 million televisions, more than 95 million smartphones. And Texas Instruments makes more than 80,000 products. And their product portfolio includes everything from smartphones to robotics. So what draws this set of companies together? We're united in a passion for low power and for driving that next era in processing. We're committed to enabling new experiences, devices that don't just do your bidding, but anticipate your needs. Devices that allow you to interact with the world around you, both virtual and physical. Devices you can never again imagine being without. So what is HSA? In essence, the heterogeneous system architecture is an architecture that allows a device to run at much less power when processing media. We're joining together to create a single architecture, a single platform definition for doing this to avoid needless fragmentation. This will create a platform that scales all the way from the smartphone to the supercomputer. And as you can see here, the technology will apply in mobile, desktop, cloud servers, and a whole range of consumer devices. As we look forward, naturally, I can't show you all of the technology that will be here in five years or ten years. That technology is still under development. But let's peek around the curtain a little. I want to give you an idea of how you'll interact with your computers, your devices, in this future we're describing. And I want to demonstrate some technology that we and our HSA partners have working today that give you a glimpse into that future. Imagine a world where your electronic devices are always on, always connected. They no longer need to be turned off or unplugged because they have extremely low power consumption in what we call wait for user mode. You don't need to log in because these devices automatically recognize you from the moment when you walk into the room. Typing is no longer required thanks to precise voice recognition and gesture recognition. Most of the time your devices no longer need to be told what to do. They already know. Take for example Amanda in the picture behind me. Her computer is no longer protected by a password she types and doesn't require what we think of today as a login. All it requires is her presence and to hear her voice, and it recognizes her, greets her, and is ready to provide her with contact. She doesn't interact with her computer via a mouse and keyboard, nor does she leave fingerprints on the very glass through which she reads articles and watches video. The computer knows what Amanda wants to look at on a weekend morning, and presents that content to her in a pleasing manner. Amanda talks to her computer as she would to a friend, and not just with her voice, but her body language. The computer can sense her mood. It can sense if she's interested in work, entertainment, or connecting with people. Today, the computer senses that her eyes are staying on the Olympic diving video, and so it grows that window, and it sees her smile and knows that it's done the right thing and leaves the, the window large. Something about that video has provoked an emotional response in Amanda. It reminded her of a trip to Australia for the Sydney Olympics that she took with her daughter many years ago. And so she speaks to the computer and says, show me videos with Kristen. And the computer switches mode and presents the videos. It takes away the previous content, and it shows video in a preview mode, in a 3D UI where every video is already streaming, making it much easier to browse and recognize what you're looking for. But Amanda's not going to browse today. Instead, she says, show me the one in Australia. And so the computer knows where every video was taken and who's in them because they've been indexed. And so it presents the video with Kristen in Australia. And it takes it immediately full screen. It doesn't require a user interaction to do that. That's the natural way to present a single video. 
Instantly, Amanda's flooded with memories from that trip, and she says, well, actually, before she says anything, the computer recognizes that what Amanda is focused on is Kristen, not videos or Australia. And it starts to look for Kristen connected anywhere in the world. And it finds her online in a coffee shop and says to Amanda, would you like Kristen to join you? And Amanda says, yes, video. And up she pops. The windows resize. And Amanda and Kristen lock eyes. And the reason they can lock eyes is even though the cameras are around the periphery of the monitor, the computer has the processing power to realign the eye direction so that they're, they're, they're looking at each other in the glass. Remember the Melbourne Garden Party, says Amanda, and the video moves to that point in its statement. Again, all of the, the, the content has been indexed, so the video search is now possible. At this point, Kristen and Amanda are in a conversation, they have media, and the computer is not part of their experience. It's receded into the background where it belongs. Now, when you think about how that experience is put together, it's built on several pillars of technology. One is the natural user interface and gestures. <clears throat> A few years ago, we used mice and keyboards and press physical buttons. Today, we touch on glass. We poke, we pinch, we spread. It's a better interface, but it's still not great. Does it really make sense to take your hand from the popcorn to the glass to pause and resume a movie and then watch the rest of the movie through a greasy fingerprint? I don't think so. Where we're headed is a world where we bring our fingers up off the glass, a few centimeters on a phone, a few more centimeters on a tablet, above the keyboard perhaps on an ultra-thin notebook, and three to five meters away from the glass on the wall that we used to call a TV. This will work through a technology we call computer vision, where the cameras on the glass capture your finger movements and the HSA computer in the device discerns the motion and makes sense of it. Not just hand gestures, think about a voice control system that's better than we enjoy today, where the voice of the machine answers in less than a second and it's correct more often than it's just amusing. Biometric recognition, those same cameras around the glass will be able to recognize a user to queue up their favorite TV shows when they walk in the room, or to unlock and start their car for them uh, as they approach it. Another important pillar is augmented reality. And augmented reality is where we interfere with the video and we substitute. We may keep the, the person and substitute the background. We may keep the background and substitute a character, an avatar. This is where real and virtual worlds meet. Uh, and it has applications uh, in a very wide variety of areas, from communication to gaming, and especially in education. So at this point, I'd like to do our first demo, and I'd like to look at an example of augmented reality, a virtual presence, in this case, it's technology to improve video conferencing or webinars. So I'd like to invite up Sanjay Patel. He's the Chief Executive Officer of Uvixa. Uh, he's going to show us some uh, technology in this area. Sanjay? Thank you, Phil. Hello, everyone. At Uvixa, what we're doing is dramatically improving the way people communicate with video. by making it more interesting, more useful, and more immersive. So let me show you today with a demonstration of our product stage presence. And what I'm doing here is using stage presence, which is taking advantage of the Microsoft Connect camera to first of all locate me, and then using some fairly sophisticated image processing and computer vision to extract me from the stage and put me virtually on the screen. So, from the user's perspective, it's quite simple. I take a Microsoft Connect. 
my camera, connect it to my Windows PC, add my content, which could be images, or PowerPoint, or even video, and then add myself. And my presentation becomes far more compelling with me part of it. So you don't need this anymore? Don't need that anymore. In fact, we just saw that. I was able to move forward and backward with my presentation. And I can do this anywhere. I don't need a special background. I don't need a green screen. Um, and thanks to the uh, technology provided by HSA, I can do this using my laptop anywhere. I can do it at work. I can do it at home. I can do it in a cafe with a very crowded background. Oh, so this is, I, I mean, I, I do a lot of presentations combined with video conferences, and we always have two screens, one with the video and one with the presentation, which gets very distracting. So you solve that problem by overlaying yourself into the presentation. Exactly. So you can imagine how this could be very useful for an online meeting. Yes. Um, it's a great tool for sales, for marketing, for education, and for training. Okay, so I, I see how it works in the business environment, but um, would there be an opportunity for a consumer at home to benefit from this technology? Absolutely. I've already got this um, photo montage up, but you can imagine that uh, when you share photos online, rather than putting up a fairly vanilla um, slideshow, photo slideshow, you can create a photo montage that's a combination of you, your pers video persona like this, uh, your photos and your voice. So here, there's a photo montage of a recent family trip. Um, here's a picture of us in Shanghai. Here's a picture of us in a Ferris wheel. And I believe that's actually my son in that cabin right there. Yeah, you, you know which cabin he is. Exactly. <laughs> I can point it out to you directly. And I can take this whole experience and I can share it with you on Skype through screen share. Oh, very nice. So then you can interact with the whole family just uh, uh, through an online account. Exactly. Very good. So, um, in terms of technology barriers, um, when we deliver you more processing at lower power, uh, how would that help uh, your technology? Well, today, in order for a somewhat to enable stage presence, you require a Microsoft Camera. It's a little large, a little bulky, not terribly portable. We're imagining a future where you can actually do this with the camera that's built into the screen of your laptop. And in order to do that, we clearly need additional computing power at very uh, energy efficient uh, points. Right, because when you've got a, a stereo camera or two uh, HD cameras built into your device, you have to do a lot of processing to extract the depth information that you get from the external depth camera. Exactly. Well, that would be wonderful, because once you can do it with built-in cameras, then it can become ubiquitous and everybody can enjoy it. Eventually on a mobile device. Indeed. Thank you. Thank you, Very nice. Well, I'd actually like to go immediately to another demo, also on an augmented reality theme. Uh, this time, it's a demo about bringing character animation and the creation of avatars, the creation of, of virtual characters uh, to consumers. And so I'd like to invite up on stage <coughs> Stefan Grasser, he's the Chief Executive Officer of Mixima. Hi, Phil. Mm -hmm. Nice to be here. Hi, everybody. But Mixamo is a spin-off from Stanford University. We started in 2008. We are based up in uh, San Francisco. And our mission is to democratize character animation. So what we want to do is, we are so passionate about animation, we want to enable anybody, not just to watch uh, animations, but to create them uh, all the way to consumer. Uh, we can show you now a video um, of a full workflow from creating a character to animate the character, uh, and, and you can appreciate the type of content that brings millions of people every year to movie theaters. But now, instead of taking years to build it, or, or days, in the best case scenario, we're going to do it just in a couple of minutes. Now, the first one that we are seeing is called Fuse. It's a product that we released in beta about uh, a week ago, and allows uh, anybody to just uh, uh, stitch together different body parts, like you are seeing now. These body parts are coming from very high quality models, uh, but here anybody can basically just take those parts and uh, uh, attach them to a character mesh that then we are going to animate. So here we have our character, maybe we're going to replace 
those uh, uh, robotic legs with something uh, more suitable for the summer. Uh, maybe with some virgin stock uh, on. Uh, there you go. So now we have our full character. Uh, it is just a mesh. We're going to stitch on it also some texture and then we're going to upload it to Mixamo. So Mixamo is the first online character animation service. Uh, people can upload their inanimated characters, just dimensions. And then our server uh, is running some very uh, computational intensive machine learning algorithms uh, to figure out how to animate those characters. So here I just move a few locators on the body of my character and then all of a sudden this uh, is becoming now a, a living uh, character that can be animated. So the next step would be uh, to choose uh, among the collection of animations that we have and then uh, create some interesting, interesting content. So what we are showing you is basically a revolution in the uh, content creation. We are shifting the paradigm from editing to experience. Creating this, uh, this type of content typically takes days and it's a very tedious process where you need some very specific technical knowledge in order to do it. Instead here we are bringing to a more high level uh, experience where I can just uh, browse different animations, apply them automatically to my character. Um, here for example we have a walk cycle that we apply to our character Jimbo uh, and then now we're going to expose a few sliders where the user uh, can influence the performance. So here I can make it look more uh, brutal or happy, more scary, and with the task of few sliders, this is all real time, I can completely change the character and the performance is basically uh, um, uh, doing. So this very seamlessly comes from the realization that even a five years old can distinguish between a good and a bad animation uh, and even though he, he or she doesn't have the technical knowledge to create this content, uh, what we are doing is enabling them, actually, to leap to the other side, from passive spectators to actual creators. And here we can see some uh, fancy dancing <laughs> motion. I think it's a, it's a twist. Uh, it's kind of old-fashioned stuff, but you know, still works. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think this concludes our, our demo uh, about character animation. Okay, so uh, this is very impressive to bring this to, to consumers through, through a cloud service. Um, I've always understood that the hardest part of character animation is dealing with the facts. So what, what kind of solutions do you have there? Yeah, I'm going to give you uh, guys a sneak peek on a, on a new technology that we are working on. It's still uh, you know, at the beginning of the, of the research. But uh, facial animation is still uh, is very important because it basically carries so much of the emotion of the character. And it's so important for the overall performance. So now I'm going to give you a quick demo of how this can work on a, on a live camera. So uh, here I have uh, myself here. You can see how my face is being tracked. And then uh, right now I'm basically doing lip syncing. So the character is talking like I'm doing. Then I can go through some expressions. <laughs> can get stuck. Like very surprised guy, you know, and, and very ecstatic. Or I can do some other facial expression to go more into like the angry face. And you see how these expressions are now naturally in real time transferred to the character without having to edit curves or anything, just in real time with a seamless experience. So anybody will be able to do that very easily in their living room. Wow, and um and so would the, the characters with this facial animation uh, be able to upload into online worlds and games? Yeah, it's something that people are doing already, uh, right now. So we have examples, for example, in Second Life, I am view, or games like EverQuest too, people are already uploading their content uh, in there and they are enjoying it because uh, it's just such a much more engaging experience to have your own creation uh, of this beautiful form of art that animation is. Uh, in the game or in the visual world that you are playing, it's supposed to be just a passive <laughs> spectator. And that's why we are so passionate about it. Wow, I can, I can see that. And what technical barriers do you face that you want to overcome in the next few years? So the number one barrier is basically the computationally intensive side of this. The more CPU and GPU we have, the better experience we can create. Uh, animation will be more accurate, more realistic, more believable. 
Uh, and maybe we can be, uh, be able to track multiple individuals at the same time and animate multiple characters at the same time, all in real time. This is very CPU and GPU intensive processes, so that's why I think HSA can be a really big promise for us. And for what we're doing. Well, thank you for sharing your technology. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Another area uh, where HSA technology is going to shine is the ever-expanding world of video. And this has three pillars as well. Content everywhere, we expect to be able to access our content, our movies, podcasts, uh, <coughs> TV shows, any kind of media anywhere in the world. We'd like to be able to do it indoors and outdoors and take it between our devices. Beyond HD, clearly we love HD experiences, but HD high definition started at 720 and 1080i, which is 2 million pixels. With movie content, we're already on the way to 8 million and 16 million pixels, and of course the Ultra HD will come to all of our devices. And audiovisual content management is, is key technology, because with this deluge of digital data in our lives, how do we manage the rich content? How do we find that clip of video where your son first took his, his first steps? How, how do you find that, that video of your vacation in Australia? We, we're going to proceed from out of the file system to being able to do full video search uh, and be able to index all of our content, whether it's on local devices or up in the cloud. So let's see another demo here, and this is a case where we tackle the problem of taking our devices everywhere, indoors and outdoors. A big challenge today is how to have a great viewing experience with a color display in bright light. I'd like to invite Michael Tooch, CEO of Apical, who's going to show us some ideas. He may have a solution to this. Thanks a lot. So we at Apical specialize in making displays adaptive to viewing conditions. And I'd like to show you some technology we call the assertive display that can have a big effect on the multimedia experience on a smartphone or a tablet. Now, we all know the problem. Uh, we like to take our devices everywhere, but if we want to watch a movie or play an immersive game, we had better be in a dark room when we do it. Um, otherwise, the experience may be really poor. And the reason is one of brightness. Outdoors today, it's several times, hundred times brighter than it is in this room, even though we don't always notice it because our eyes are just for us. There's a big problem for displays because it means they have to run very bright. That means they have to consume a lot of power. And in fact, on a tablet, the display is the largest consumer of the battery on the device. So we take an alternative approach to this, and our solution is based on processing the pixels of the video screen in real time based on a model of how a human eye works. And let me show you how that, that works in practice. So if we can watch the video, please. So we're viewing this tablet indoors, but there's a window in the room, uh, and it's daylight. When we're using the UI, there's no problem. But see what happens if we want to watch a movie, or in this case, play an atmospheric game. It's very difficult to see what's going on. Uh, it, it, there's not much we can see, especially in shadows, uh, because screen reflects off the display. And there's nothing we can do about this with brightness. This is already working at full power. Here we've got two devices, the left with our assertive display and the right with the standard device. With the assertive display on, you can see everything. But on the standard device, many scenes are difficult to view because the content has too high contrast for the display in these conditions. On the left-hand device, we're continuously adapting the video stream to the contrast of the display under the actual viewing conditions. And that's why it looks so natural and, and like our TV experience. These devices are working at exactly the same power. Here's a, a game. We, that game on the right is impossible to play. I have to go into a dark room or, or close the curtains to have any chance. On the left, again, we're adapting the content so we can see. Here we're turning on and off our processing with a button just to show we're not playing any tricks. Uh, when it's off, it's very difficult to see what's, what's going on. When it's on, we can see everything. And again, let me remind you, we're not changing the brightness or the power of this display at all. We're just tuning the pixels. 
back that movie again. This movie was intended to be viewed on an HDTV that has a contrast ratio of 5,000 to 1. This device here has a contrast ratio of around 50 to 1. So we need to help it if it's going to give us the experience that the content creator intended us to have under whatever conditions we happen to be viewing. This is a challenging case. We've got mixed content. We've got a video window and a UI. Our processing is to be clever enough to only adjust the, the video and not touch the UI because that's going to be very distracting if we do that. That's one of the things that makes it challenging. Finally, let's look at outdoors on a sunny day. We wouldn't expect to see much, but let's see what happens if we turn on our processing and play this game. Actually, it's, it's a good experience. Um, I can see everything. I, I wouldn't be at any disadvantage against an opponent who was sitting in a dark room playing against me. And the overall experience is really, really immersive and satisfying. So, in conclusion, um, we can take uh, outdoors, we can go outdoors on a sunny day with a standard display, and we can watch uh, a movie and play a game without killing the battery. And that's what this is all about. Thank you. So, so let me see if, if I understood it. Typically when we take a colour device outside or we're looking at it in a, in a bright environment, we turn up the brightness control. And what that does is it turns up the backlight, which draws a lot of power, but doesn't really help with high contrast. So you're actually reprocessing the pixels and putting different value pixels in the frame buffer and leaving the backlight down so you draw the same or less power. That's right. The, the auto backlight function on devices, which is the way of dealing with this normally, is very wasteful and it's ineffective because this is not a problem of brightness, it's a problem of contrast ratio. And that's what we're doing here. We're adapting the contrast ratio of the content to fit the display. And that's why we get this good viewing experience. So, um, what will HSA do for you? It seems like you've solved uh, a lot of things already. Oh, yes, I mean, the challenge of this is the processing we need to do is pretty heavy. We have to process each pixel individually in real time with very short latency, so, so the user doesn't notice. And that means currently we have to do this in dedicated hardware. Um, what we'd really like to do is run this on our processor so it could proliferate very widely across all devices. At the moment, devices need to get uh, more parallel, more memory efficient and more power efficient for that app. And that's the direction the HSA is taking and that's what we're excited about. That's why we've joined the foundation. Well, thank you. And before we close, I mean, we, we've only known each other for a, for a short while, but I know you're a fairly modest chap. I just hope people realize that, <coughs> that any color display today to be viewable in bright light, it has a little technology. No one else has solved this, right? I, I think you're right. I mean, um, the display industry spent many years and had spent very large sums of money on this issue. Um, but it's a problem that can't be solved by the display alone. And uh, you know, we've got a solution, and, uh, and it works. So, yeah, I think you're right. Congratulations. Thank you very much. Thank you. Today, we record video like never before from our phones, handheld video cams, tablets. This is creating a new generation of amateur movie makers. But today, those movie makers don't have access to the modeling, editing, CGI tools that are used by the professionals in Hollywood and Bollywood. That's all about to change. We'll take a look at a new technology from Otoy that allows you to create high quality movies from almost any device with the heavy lifting done in the cloud. I'd like to invite Jules Oba, he's the Chief Executive Officer of Overtoy, to give us a guiding tour of this technology. Thank you, Phil. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, at Overtoy, we've been very focused on two, uh, two technologies. Cloud streaming, where all the processing is done on faraway servers and the results are streamed uh, you know, in real time to an end device, and very high rendering. So when Phil was talking earlier about uh, movies and video games converging, you know, we're at the point where we want to see uh, the high quality that you see in a film like Transformers or Avengers running a video game uh, with video game interactivity. That's the kind of technology that we're creating. And in order for that to happen as quickly as possible, we decided to put this technology in the cloud. Uh, so to that end, we're actually launching a service for artists, consumers, uh, anyone to use that will deliver this kind of 
really unique rendering power uh, as a cloud service. And we're here to show a demo of that today. Uh, this will be added in a few months. Um, but let's, uh, let's take a look at my laptop here. This is running just a, uh, a typical APU. It's, it's not a very powerful laptop. Um, and this rendering that you're seeing here, this, this is something that would take 40 hours to do on a, on a movie studio render farm. Uh, it includes reflections and all these other complex effects that go way beyond not just video games, but even what's used in a film render uh, for, for a movie. And this is actually not rendering on this machine, it's rendering on a faraway server, but as you can see when I move around, and I'm moving this just by pointing and clicking on the scene, it updates instantly. So we're going from 40 hours to, to real time. And we're going from millions of dollars of rendering servers to a service that can be streamed to a user for uh, 10 euros uh, a month or a few uh, euros an hour, depending on how much rendering power that you want. Uh, from a quality perspective and a simplicity perspective, there's, nothing, there's never been a drag and drop solution to compete with the likes of George Lucas or Steven Spielberg until now. I mean, we can deliver that by having artists that work with these tools, uh, providing their own material libraries, their own techniques, and just through drag and drop, I can completely change the way I see renders. And this is all running live, this is all running through a uh, stream. Uh, and, and it's actually so intuitive that many complex effects that are not used in films become completely accessible. You just saw depth of field. Uh, in fact, the entire camera system is very much like a real physical camera. So when I change the aperture setting, it's no different than uh, me with a real camera changing the aperture on, a, on my camera. And all you can see here, it, it, it does perfect blurring. It's physically correct. Uh, and this applies not just to the camera, but to physical materials and objects in the scene as well. Whether it's luminous uh, light bulbs or even the sun, uh, which I can just change the position of by pointing to a different place on the map. And as you were just seeing there, I, mean, I can turn the sun off, and all of a sudden the entire scene changes. I need to focus my camera a little bit here so you can see better. Um, but this kind of rendering with glass and with lighting and all these complex reflections is, is something that, again, would take hours to render per frame. And here we're delivering it over the cloud in real time and streaming it into a, uh, into a window. Uh, there's one other element that we're looking at launching uh, before the end of this year, which takes this concept one step further. Uh, this is our own tool, our own UI that we've created so that artists can, uh, can get into this right away. But there are 60 million or so uh, users out there that know the 3D tool already, such as Autodesk Max or Maya. And in fact, Autodesk is, a, uh, is an investor and partner of, of Otoy. Uh, and what I'm showing here is also rendering in the cloud. And this combines Octane Render, uh, which is our rendering service, with Autodesk 3D Studio Max. And what's interesting is that Autodesk 3D Studio Max is running in the same cloud as the rendering solution. And typically, if you look at these three gray squares, this is how an artist would used to work within 3D Studio Max. They would see a rough approximation of their scene, and if they wanted to move the camera around, uh, they would have to wait a long time for that render to update. And as you can see here, while well, the rendering is instantaneous, no matter what you're doing inside of these scenes, you can actually see the update happening instantly with reflections and depth of field and everything happening completely in real time and completely in the cloud. And what's interesting is this is, an, in fact, an entire window system that we're streaming into this, uh, into this stream. So you have a virtual PC in the cloud. It's streaming at 60 frames a second. There's no latency. And the entire concept of having a computer uh, or how much computing power you have is completely turned on its head. And I'm going to show one more, uh, one more little demonstration of how far we can take this concept. Uh, and I'm just going to load this very same session up on an iPad. And this is now running also at 60 hertz, uh, interactively on my iPad. I have Windows, I have 3D Studio Maps, and I have my, uh, my rendering power all available in the cloud. And there's absolutely no latency as well. And this is wireless, so there's no wires, there's, no, uh, there's nothing that's, that's actually um, stopping this from running uh, with me on, on the, anywhere in the world. Uh, and this is really exciting because now, you know, companies like Autodesk that have created tools like 3 Studio Maps, or these kinds of technologies that, that can aggregate 1,000, 2,000, 100,000 dollars of rendering power, can stream to a $299 device in real time with no late, no lag, no latency, uh, and that's pretty impressive. Uh, and the only other thing that we get questions about when we show this technology is, well, how far away can this work from the server? So we're, uh, you know, we're located in Los Angeles. And we have our server here in Los Angeles running a similar scene. And uh, this is uh, rendering from LA to Berlin. And the latency is basically about a quarter of a millisecond. Sorry, a quarter of a second, which is completely uh, usable for interactive scenes. And that's happening around the world. So anywhere you are in the world, we can deliver this experience 
uh, and we can deliver really computing power on demand. And that's something that I think is going to be incredibly disruptive and powerful for consumers and developers alike. I think that's quite amazing. <laughs> so, the situation I outlined. I'm an amateur movie maker. I've shot some uh, some video footage on, on a handy cam, uh, and now I can create CGI effects up in the cloud. How do I put it all together? Well, the tools that we're showing running in the cloud, such as Autodesk Maps and Light, can be complemented with video editing tools, such as Autodesk Combustion, uh, Toxic, and Osmic, which allow you to blend video that you can upload to the cloud uh, with these kinds of 3D rendering tools that we're creating and adding uh, onto the system. So an end user could use those applications uh, and mix and match the 3D rendering that we're showing today with their own videos and deliver something that looks pretty amazing to YouTube. And I think that's going to empower a whole new generation of content creators. Uh, and you know, we're very excited to see that happen. Oh, I, am, I am too. And so, you know, same final question to you. What are your technological barriers that are holding you back? You know, what kind of service do you want to be offering five years from now? I think five years from now, I mean, this, this again is a $299 tablet device. Uh, really, we just need the screen and the internet connection. So we can imagine a $29 device delivering the same experience with a million dollars worth of computing power on the cloud. And that, those two points are going to converge to the point where we think we can deliver um, really inexpensive cloud computing to really inexpensive devices and have that be supported worldwide. Very nice. Thank you, Joe. Well, I hope you enjoyed these demos from our foundation members and partners that show some hints uh, of this future ahead of us. As we go through this next inflection point with HSA, our experiences will become truly richer and more immersive. We call this surround computing. Our apps run faster as the media processing becomes more efficient. And with more Processing horsepower, we can produce stunning visuals, whether it's to high density, small screens, or to whole walls of glass. More efficient media processing doesn't just mean fast and beautiful, it also means lower power and multi-day battery life. And as we do all this, interactivity goes up with gesture and voice controls at new levels of accuracy. As the keyboard, mouse, and touch screens recede, voice and gesture controls take over, everything becomes easier to use. We see bookmarks working in ebooks today, but imagine the continuity when your web browsing, TV shows, podcasts, movies, and apps follow you automatically from your home to your car to the coffee shop to wherever you go next. This is the vision of the HSA Foundation for the future. As we develop the technology for HSA and bring it to market, the HSA Foundation itself is growing fast. We launched just two months ago with an initial set of founder members setting the vision and inviting the whole industry to join us. Just two months later, we now have 12 members. And you'll notice that the new members are in a range of technology areas. Infrastructure, hardware, software, tools, display, graphics IP. And we expect this tent to become wider as more people come into the fall. We have dozens more companies already in negotiations to join. It's a really exciting time for the HSA Foundation as we gear up to drive that next 10 years of computer innovation. In 60 plus years, we've already experienced a lot of changes in computing. We've gone from the industrial computing era to personal computing area, and then to mobile and cloud infrastructure and convergence. And at every step, it's technology inflection points that drove us forward to new and better machines, new and more rewarding experiences. We're on the cusp of that next technology inflection. Today we see people looking at glass and literally bumping into each other on sidewalks, hallways, and even roads. We spend too much time looking at and touching our devices. It's time to do better and take it to the next level. HSA Technology and the HSA Foundation want to make the computers just disappear from our view, leaving you with the experience instead of the machine. Let's project the visuals where you need them. Let's get your fingers up off the glass. Let's get you walking upright again and driving with your eyes on the road. The next technology transition is going to be profound. 
and it's going to change the way we live our lives again. We at the HSA Foundation will be your guides on that journey and we'll deliver the technology that makes this change happen. I want to thank our four demo presenters today from Nuvixa, Mixamo, Apical and Otoy for showing the way that they're already trailblazing the way towards the HSA future. And they'll be available after the keynote to answer your questions. And finally, on behalf of the HSA Foundation, I want to say a big thank you to you and to Aoife for providing us this opportunity to lay out to you the future of computer innovation. You're going to love the experiences we're going to enable for all of you. Thank you.